Without any further ado, um, today uh, we are going through a continuation of our series on prayer, uh, Victorious Praying, actually. And as a part of Victorious Praying, today we are talking about fasting. And uh, that's kind of an interesting uh, topic. Um, I think many of you guys maybe have uh, some ideas of what that might be and what that might not be, and, and maybe I will confirm some of those thoughts tonight, and maybe I will open your mind to some new thoughts uh, on that as well. But to start out, I want to tell uh, a bit of a story. It's not my story, actually, but a story uh, from D.L. Moody, uh, founder of Moody Bible Institute. And um, he tells a, a story um, shortly after his church burned down in Chicago, uh, the Chicago fire, um, he went to England, and it was uh, the year 1872. And the purpose of this trip actually uh, was not for him to preach, but actually for him to study. So he was going to go to, uh, to churches to, to be able to learn and, and get himself ready for when his church was, was rebuilt. And um, after a prayer meeting one night uh, in London, there was a pastor there by the name of John Lessie, and he spotted Moody there at his church and uh, urged him, he said, I really want you to preach next Sunday for me at my church. And um, Moody was a bit reluctant. That really wasn't what he had gone over there to do, but he agreed to uh, anyway. So um, the next morning he goes to preach, and in the, the first service, there's a morning service and an evening service. First service just went terrible. He just felt like people were completely indifferent, not engaged at all, didn't really seem to be caring. He, he said that it was probably one of the hardest times that he had ever had preaching, ever. So the thought of him having to spend the afternoon thinking about him having to do the same sermon that evening for another crowd was not really all that great of an afternoon. Let's just put it that way, right? So a little bit discouraging. But the thing was, he came into the evening service and it was a completely different atmosphere. In fact, the Moody sensed that there was this energizing presence uh, in the Spirit of God. And in his words, he said, the power of an unseen world seemed to have fallen upon us. And at the very close of his sermon, he asked those who desired to become Christians to please stand. And all at once, about 500 people rose up on their feet. So, of course, he thought for a second, maybe this was a mistake. So he made everybody sit back down and he asked them again. And all of the same people stood back up again, 500 people. So then, again, he asked them to be seated, and he said, you know what, if, if really all of you want to become Christians, then what I want you to do is I want you to uh, step up after the service here into the inquiry room, uh, which is another room in the church there. So, uh, of course, the entire 500 of this group enter this inquiry room. They even had to go get, like, extra chairs and all this kind of stuff to fit everybody, right? And he prayed for them, and he presented them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he asked for all of them who were actually honest and really earnest to, to meet that him the very next night. So Monday night comes around, and there were more people than there were on Sunday. Even more people. It was crazy. So Moody was urged to return, and he ministered for 10 straight days to these hundreds and hundreds of people, okay? So, of course, at this point, Moody is like flabbergasted, and he's, he's basically saying, like, th there had to be some kind of unusual prayer behind this amazing response. So, after the fact, he finds out about this girl. This girl, by the name of Marianne Adler. She was bedridden, and she had heard about Moody's presence from her sister after he had preached in the morning. She had been praying for God for a long time to send revival to her congregation, and she had also earlier read an article written by Moody. So she kept this article under her pillow, and she continually asked God to send this man to her church. When she learned he was there, she asked all visitors, uh, excuse me, she uh, asked that her sister lock the door to her room, she uh, said, send no dinner, and she refused all visitors so that she could spend the entire afternoon and night in prayer and fasting. God was delighted to work in the response to her prayer. On Moody's follow-up visit to her, she pledged to pray for him until she or he went to be home with the Lord. Wow. What a story. Isn't that exciting? It seemed to me that that afternoon, in some sort of sense, D.L. Moody was in need of a spiritual breakthrough in his life. Maybe we should try fasting. 
Tonight, I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about uh, learning to fast. I want to talk about the benefits of what happens when we do fast. And also, kind of a practical, how do we start? Okay? So, learning to fast. What is fasting? A gentleman by the name of Richard Foster wrote a great book uh, on spiritual disciplines, and he defines fasting as the voluntary denial of a normal function for an intense spiritual activity. Now, usually in the Bible, and when you think of it, and when you look at the screen right now, you think of eating, right? Think fasting, that means, oh, I don't get to eat. Oh, man, there has to be another way, right? Especially you guys out there. But it's also mentioned from another, uh, a couple different ways in Scripture, uh, one of which it's uh, mentioned twice, both in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and also in Daniel chapter 6, is actually fasting from sleep. Uh, the only problem is, generally speaking, when we try to fast from sleep, or, or many of us maybe say, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray before I go to bed, it's, dear Lord, right? So we have to actually stay awake, remember, to, to fast from sleep, okay? Just a reminder of that. But this means that the Bible's emphasis uh, is generally on food, but it actually refers to a broader use of self-restraint and other things. Uh, sometimes these things are, are things that have either knowingly or unknowingly uh, become substitutes for God, or in other words, idols in our lives. Uh, for instance, some of us might be able to benefit from fasting from media, or some of us might uh, need to fast a bit from recreational shopping. Okay? So why fast? What is the purpose of fasting? There's a Norwegian theologian by the name of O. Hallisby, and he uh, said that the purpose of fasting is this, to loosen to some degree the ties which bind us to the world or material surroundings as a whole in order that we may concentrate all of our spiritual powers upon the unseen and eternal things. So the purpose of fasting really is concentrating on godliness. This allows us to invite the Holy Spirit to do a more intense work on us so that we can solely be focused on God alone. So, one thing to be clear on. We do not gain any kind of favor from God by fasting. If you're looking for favor from God, put your faith in Jesus Christ. Don't fast, okay? Christ's death on the cross earned us every single spiritual blessing. That's what it says in Ephesians 1.3. And every spiritual discipline, just like fasting, should rest on the foundation only of Jesus Christ's finished work through his death and resurrection. So, what happens when I fast? Okay? Um, when we talk about food, there are some things that actually happen to us physically when we fast. When you fast for food, there's a greater amount of blood that is usually needed for digestion, and it's actually then available to you, if it's not digesting your food, uh, for mental and spiritual concentration. In fact, uh, author Neil Anderson says, Eating is the granddaddy of all appetites. Fasting is a commitment to bring about self-denial and overcome every other conceivable temptation. In other words, it is a response to the Lord to seek him and abstain from food or other normal activity to make the entirety of your heart available to God. So what kind of fasts are actually mentioned in the Bible? Uh, there's a couple different kinds, three of them that I'm going to mention here. Um, first of all, we call it the normal fast, okay? It's probably the thing that you normally think of when you think of fasting. In other words, what it is is to abstain from all food, but you can still drink water, Okay? It's assumed by most Bible scholars that Jesus drank water during his 40-day uh, fast that we're aware of in Scripture. First here, the reference in Matthew uh, 4.2 refers to his hunger, that is Jesus' hunger, but not his thirst. But the second reason behind that is because normally the body can only really function on uh, three days without water. The second type of fast that we see is what's called the absolute fast. The absolute fast includes water. So that means that you can't have food, but you also can't have water, okay? So for instance, uh, Ezra in the Old Testament ate no food and drank no water in Ezra chapter 10, verse 6, and because he was mourning over the unfaithfulness of God's people. Um, another example that we see in the Old Testament is Esther, uh, who requested a three-day absolute fast on her behalf as she sought to deliver his people from destruction in Esther 4, verse 16. 
And then another one we see too is the Apostle Paul. Many of you are familiar with him. Um, you guys know uh, probably that he was converted on the road to Damascus, and after that he experienced a three-day absolute fast. We see that in Acts chapter 9. And then finally, uh, we also see kind of a, an unusual situation of an absolute fast with the record of Moses in, in Deuteronomy chapter 9 when he actually absolute, had an absolute fast of 40 days long. And this is usually put into the category of supernatural fasting. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is, please do not try an absolute fast of 40 days like Moses, okay? Because you will die, okay? And God barring a miracle in your life, okay? So don't tell your parents that I told you to do that, all right? So, the absolute fast of this length of time for Moses is absolutely God's intervention for his survival. But then lastly, we have another type of fast that we see often too, which is the partial fast. We see this in Daniel chapter 10, verse 3. And it refers to, uh, at this point, a, a three-week partial fast in which Daniel said that he would abstain from tasty food of meat and wine. Okay? So the partial fast is emphasized by a restriction of the diet rather than just this absence of all entire food. All right? So then the question becomes, when... When do we fast? Okay? And the interesting thing is, is that in Scripture, we never see Jesus formally command us to fast, or his followers for that matter. In fact, uh, the truth is, though, is that the way he spoke was that he already expected that fasting was part of the lives of those who followed him. In Matthew chapter 6, he actually gives instructions on three things. He says to give, to pray, and to fast. And then specifically, he says, when you give, or when you pray, or when you fast. So he's assuming that we do that. This clearly shows that these things would have been practiced by his people in this time. But in fact, he very simply stated, after his departure from earth, he said his followers will fast. He makes that assumption, that they will do it. In fact, uh, this is the, one of the main scriptures for tonight. Matthew 9, chapter 15, Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests be sad while the groom is with them? The time will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. This was his response to the Pharisees coming to him and, and saying, you know, why, why aren't your disciples fasting? They're celebrating because they're with Jesus, but don't worry, they're going to be fasting when I'm gone. You see, throughout the book of Acts, as well as further evidence from a number of historians, including Philip Schaff, note that during these first three centuries of Christianity after Jesus' ascension, Christians typically fa fasted two times a week. Um, in fact, they would do it on two opposite days of what uh, some of the original Pharisees and other church leaders would do, just to kind of separate themselves from them. But the question really becomes to us, is that, okay, I get it, people did this back in Jesus' day, what about today? Are, are Christians today really expected to fast in a regular type of basis here? I think while we see throughout Scripture that there are a number of biblical patterns on fasting, like, for instance, the annual Day of Atonement was a yearly thing where, where people would do that, there are also no biblical commands, like I mentioned, from Jesus. So what this means to us is that we are free. We are spiritually free as Christians and perfectly accepted by God, not on the basis of whether or not we fast, but on the basis of Jesus Christ's work alone by the grace of God. So Richard Foster, again, uh, notes, Our freedom in the gospel, however, does not mean license. It means opportunity. So what I'm telling you tonight is not that you have to fast or that you can fast, I'm telling you that you have the opportunity to fast, and that's exciting. In fact, it was the Apostle Paul's freedom that led him to fast on that road to Damascus. Christ set him free, and he chose to fast. Some of his fasting may have been due to some of his circumstance or suffering, but there's no doubt that it was also to cultivate an enjoyment with the fellowship of Christ. But the ultimate answer to the question of regular fasting lies in the heart of God. Fasting needs to be focused on God, not us. And it needs to be directed by God, not us. This isn't just like, hmm, I think I'll fast next week. Okay? This is spending time in prayer like we've been talking about for the last five, six weeks to really understand the heart of God. And when you feel him calling you to do something big or to change something in your life, to, to think about 
what is it that I need to spend extra time with the Lord where I can set aside a meal or I can set aside media or I can set aside something to give myself the time to spend with him to make some important decisions in my life? And this needs to be empowered by God through your prayer with him. But I think the best question that you can ask God about fasting is this. Lord, how do you desire me to make use of fasting in my life? How do you desire me to make use of that in my life? So let's talk about the benefits of fasting. There are some physical benefits, which I'll mention. Um, Fasting is helpful to give your body a rest. In fact, when you fast, your digestive system is able to rest, and your circulatory and nervous systems are able to slow down. Fasting also aids the cleansing of the body, as the body is able to concentrate on the elimination of toxins in your system. And this elimination tends to sharpen your senses as well. However, these physical reasons for fasting really aren't the first priority. The first priority is actually the spiritual reasons. So what are some spiritual reasons of why fasting can benefit you? Let me give you an example. Back in the fall, I was going through a bit of a rough patch. Um, I am very busy, like many of you. And in the midst of that busyness, I was having a really hard time finding good, uninterrupted amounts of time to be able to spend with the Lord, both in Bible reading, in prayer, just in my relationship with him. I was really struggling, and I just felt just kind of lethargic in my faith in a lot of ways. And I had this class on, on, in my um, classes at Moody, and one of the books that I read really challenged me to think about fasting. And as it came to that, I prayed to the Lord and I asked him what he wanted me to do. And my first thought, of course, was food. I thought, no, why me? I didn't want to go through that. I mean, it would be terrible if I couldn't eat all those Vandy Wall bars in my office. But the truth was, was that's not what he convicted me of. What he convicted me of was the fact that I was wasting time. I was sitting here saying to myself, Oh, Lord, I don't have time for you. I don't have time for you. I got school. I got family. I got work. I got this. I got that. I got a retreat this weekend, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is overwhelming. Please help me. And God said to me, he said, you know what? You waste a lot more time than what you think you do. So I fasted from media. No TV. The only media that I could ever use was if I had to use it for work for one reason or another. I had, uh, my wife has a password on my phone, so I can't add or delete apps or any of that kind of stuff. So I had her open that up for me. I deleted like all of my favorite apps and I had her lock it back up. So I just had my basic phone with basically nothing fun to do at all. Sorry guys, that meant the end of Clash of Clans for me, I must admit. Um, It was and I haven't gone back. So, but the truth is, is that was one of the very best things that happened to me this last fall because God showed me some incredible things through that time. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But what it made me do is it made me revisit the priorities in my life, and I started recognizing that I could have time to spend with God if I got rid of some of the distractions in my life. But the aim of this is the cultivation of having this conscious enjoyment of God and his presence in our lives, okay? This clearly is the spirit of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 9.15. In fact, I really like the way John Piper put it when he said this. The absence of fasting is the measure of our, commit, of our contentment with the absence of Christ. I'll say that again. The absence of fasting is the measure of our contentment with the absence of Christ. Are you content without Christ in your life? Do you desire true contentment and joy in God. If you do, author by the name of Bill Bright shares some spiritual benefits in one of his books that he wrote called The Coming Revival, America's Call to Fast, Pray, and Seek God's Face. I want to mention very quickly the seven benefits that he says. The first one is that fasting is a primary means of restoration. If you need restoration in your life, you need to pray about fasting, okay? By humbling us, fasting releases the Holy Spirit to do whatever work that he needs to do, his revival work inside us. And this takes us to a deeper, into into the, excuse me, this takes us deeper into the Christ-like 
uh, Christ's life and gives us a greater awareness of God's reality and presence in our lives. The second thing that we get is fasting reduces the power of self so that the Holy Spirit can do more intense work within us. Guys, when we are so focused on ourselves, we think we can do everything. But when we humble ourselves enough to know that it's only God who can do the good things in our lives, the Holy Spirit takes over and he can do even more work within us than we can do for ourselves. Fasting also, thirdly, helps us to purify us spiritually. Fourthly, it helps us increase our spiritual reception by quieting our minds and our emotions. Friends, I told you a few weeks ago, we are addicted to noise. Spend time in quiet with the Lord. Number five, fasting brings yieldedness, even a holy brokenness, resulting in an inner calm and self-control for us. Sixth, fasting renews spiritual vision for our lives. And lastly, fasting inspires determination to follow God's plan for your life. One other spiritual note that I'd like to mention is that I think we also get increased insight to receive regarding the things that control us. In fact, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is helpful. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be brought under the control of anything. It's 1 Corinthians 6.12. Now the thing is, is not only... Can it help us identify the destructive attitudes of things like fear and anger and jealousy and pride and greed? But it also, the gifts of God that have gotten out of balance in our life, it can help us identify. When we allow our appetites to become our God in our life, then we lose the ability to truly enjoy the gracious gifts that God has given us. Again, Richard Foster states this. He says, Our human cravings and desires are like rivers that tend to overflow their banks. Fasting helps keep them in their proper channels. So, how do we start? First thing we need to do is we need to be aware of the abuses of fasting, okay? Again, I'm going to mention this because it's very important, and I know I said it once, but you cannot earn God's favor by fasting. You can't do it. Secondly, fasting is never a substitute for repentance and obedience. Okay? You need to come to God, admit your sins, ask for forgiveness, and then follow him. Repentance means turning 180 degrees away from sin and toward God. The third thing is that fasting must not be used to impress others, which is often the Pharisees' problem. So, if we want to do a fast from food, how do we prepare, okay? The first thing uh, that we need to talk about is, is physically how do we prepare for it, okay? If your diet consists of bacon and brownies, you should probably think about having a healthier diet before you take a fast, okay? I'm just for warning you, it might be really challenging for you, okay? What I'm trying to say is, is that you should have nutritional eating habits, okay? Or maybe you need to have repentance for lack of this, which is probably where I might fall into line. In some cases, please remember, too, that a doctor's approval and guidelines might be necessary, especially if you have things like diabetes or maybe a heart condition or some other types of things like that. And I suggest that you start with either a partial fast or a normal fast instead of an absolute fast, because if you've never done it before, it can wreak a little bit of havoc on your body, okay? So uh, you can even start with one meal. Or you could even do, instead of uh, doing just one meal, you could do a juice fast, where it's all you drink is nutritional juice for like 24 hours or something like that, okay? In fact, we have a doctor in the room, so you could ask him if you have questions about some of these things, too. I'm sure he's an expert at this, so, yep, absolutely. So, another thing that might be helpful for some of you is a partial fast from sugar. It might be challenging but it might be a good thing for you. Or coffee. Ooh, that one might be rough too, right? But the point is, is that these things are just suggestions. Shh. They're just suggestions. I want you to let the Lord guide you in prayer if you are going to do something like this, okay? Now, to make a plan and purpose for fasting, we need to understand that you don't just fast because you think you should do it, okay? Don't do it just because you think you should do it. 
We see in Zechariah chapter 7, verse 5, that it should be done for the Lord. And we see in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, that it should be motivated out of love toward God and love toward others. For instance, when I did my, my media fast this past fall, my spiritual objective was asking the Lord to remove idols in my life. I was saying to him, God, I have this feeling that I'm being distracted by things because you know what? I need to and should be able to find time for you in the day, and I can't. Show me the idols in my life that are distracting me from you. What was distracting me from God? Every time that I would think about turning on the TV, I would pray. Every time I went to my phone and was like, oh, no clash of clans. I would pray. Every single time I went to my phone and looked for Yahoo Fantasy Sports, I would pray. Every time I looked for whatever, you know, you get the point. Every single time I would do, in the first few days, I tell you, I was praying a lot because I kept, I'm like, oh my gosh, I really look at my phone this much? And the amazing thing is, I think we are all like that, is that we don't even realize what we're doing. And next thing you know, it's like, oh, stoplight, phone, oh, Whatever, I, you know, it's just you're going to your phone automatically. I have 10 seconds. I can look at something, right? It's amazing how much we are on our phones. But the point here is that instead of spending my time on media, I was, it was a reminder to me to run to God and pray that I would focus on him, okay? Guys, fasting is not skipping lunch and sleeping, Okay? Fasting is being purposeful with the time. In other words, you are replacing time with you are replacing time that you would normally be doing something with time with God. Okay? It's not just I'm gonna fast for this day and I'm going to do homework and sleep and just try not to think about it. Okay? That's not the point of it at all. All right. The point is that God honors every single effort that you give in setting aside time to seek him out. There are a number of purposes for fasting. I will talk about just a few of them real quickly. I'm almost done. In times when you feel like you are being attacked in spiritual warfare, fasting can be a God-appointed means to experience deliverance from Christ in that. Okay? Secondly, fasting may be to express your intense concern for the work of God somehow in your life. We see this in Nehemiah chapter 1. Fasting may also be a way to express your grief. We see this in 2 Samuel in uh, several places, in verse 1 and verse, excuse me, chapter 1 and chapter 12. And then fourthly, we can see uh, that it could be also to keep our desires under control and uh, to give that control back to the Holy Spirit if we've been holding on to that ourselves. See that in 1 Corinthians 9 and Romans chapter 13. So my question to you tonight and my challenge to you is, are you in need of a spiritual breakthrough in your life? Are you feeling at all like Moody was feeling that afternoon after his first sermon fell flat? God can do amazing things in your life if you spend time with him purposefully and ask for his help. So what tonight is God laying upon your heart? My challenge to you tonight before you go to bed, plan a time to seek God and ask him if fasting might be something for you. Allow yourself extra sleep and use the time to get into scripture to pray. Before we go tonight, one of the things I like to do is have you guys talk a little bit in small groups. And then after that, we're going to spend some time praying about this. Okay? So what I'd like you to do in just a moment here is get in groups of about four to six or seven people. And I want you to answer these three questions. I'll give you a few minutes here to do that. And then I'll come back up here and lead us in a time of prayer when we can pray about some of this stuff. Okay. All right. Go ahead.